Good morning. Ooh. Man, if you weren't awake, you are now with my microphone. Holy cow. Would you mind turning me down just a smidgen, ladies? Thank you. I don't need to be that loud. <laughs> Welcome to worship this day. We got some rain last night. Oh my gosh, so lovely. It is wonderful to have you all here, and for anyone who is joining us online, thank you so much. It is good to be the church and to be together. We always start the service off with just some announcements so you can know what's going on in the life of the church. Following worship today, um, we'll give a little time for some fellowship time, <clears throat> but I'm giving my Holy Land trip presentation today, and if you can't come today, I'm doing it again on Tuesday. So I just want to clarify, it. <clears throat> it's going to be the same presentation both days. It's not a part two. So if you can't come today, you can come on Tuesday at 6. So And it'll be in here. So like I said, we'll have some time to have some fellowship time together. And then we'll probably meet in here around 11 for that. So I look forward to sharing my stories and some of my pictures with you. So thank you for in advance for coming to that. Um, Crafternoon is going to be taking place on October 1st, um, and we still need people to sign up for that. So uh, if uh, you are interested in crafting one of the pumpkins that are out there, um, please make sure to sign up. And if you have any questions, can they come talk to who? Nancy. Thank you. Wonderful. Feed My Starving Children. We're doing another event um, as a church family to go to Feed My Starving Children next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, I should say. Um, at 2 o'clock, and so we're still looking for a few more people to sign up, so we kind of have a substantial size group to go. So if you're available next Saturday at 2 p.m., it's at the Coon Rapids location, um, please put your name down to sign up. Um, my boys are elated and so excited to go. It's one of their favorite things to do, and so um, it's a really fun energy. If you've never done it before, I highly recommend it. It's really, really fun. And then, um, of course, we still have the sign-up for the bazaar out there for people to sign up to help um, in setup and take down on a few uh, odd jobs during the bazaar. So that's out there as well. So um, if you could just check all the signups out there, even just to look at them and get a kind of idea and physical look at it um, and write your name down on something, that would be lovely because this is how we do church together too. It's not just Sunday mornings. So wonderful uh, opportunities. Sunday school is uh, happening again today, so following the children's message, the kids are going to be invited to head out um, with Brenda and Karen today uh, to learn a little bit more um, about our lesson. Our lesson today is the wonderful story of the landowner who goes and gets his workers uh, in the morning and all throughout the day, and they all get paid the same wage, and it's all about, that's not fair. So we're going to talk a little bit about fairness today, so looking forward to that as well. Those are all the announcements that I have, I believe. Um, we do have uh, a few prayer requests uh, just for you to be aware of so we can hold one another in prayer that need it. Uh, Wally Guptill's father died this past week, um, and his service is going to be tomorrow up in Hinkley, and there's information on the inside back cover of the bulletin. Um, if you are interested in attending the visitation or funeral um, for that. So we hold Wally and um, all the family and friends that are mourning that profound loss. Uh, we also had a wedding yesterday. Grace Roggie's daughter, Caitlin, got married yesterday to her husband, Shay, or Ryan Shay. So fun, wonderful couple. Um, and if you don't know, they're also expecting a baby. Um, as well, a little baby boy. So lots to celebrate in that family, and it was really fun to be with them yesterday um, to celebrate that union. So um, those are the things that are going on in the church and among one another that we can hold each other in prayer of joy and celebration, but also um, in need of healing and peace. I think that's all I have for announcements, unless there's anything I'm missing. Otherwise, I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able so we can begin our service with a time of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, 
the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us for the unjust demands placed on others. Creation, forgive us for the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor. Forgive us, lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Let's sing our opening hymn, 532. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the 
us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And I want to invite the kids forward for a little time with me this morning up front. Good morning. I like your dress. Come have a seat up here. Hi, guys. Come on up. Awesome. Okay. Do you guys know what it means to be fair? What does it mean to be fair? To be equal. To be equal? Okay. That would not be fair. So would you say that being fair means everyone gets the same, everyone gets treated the exact same yeah. and, and gets the same thing? Yeah, like if I have Sometimes. a banana, I split the same half. You split it directly in half and then shared it, which is very nice of you to share sometimes. Okay, yes. Have you ever said those words before? That's not fair. Oh, okay. So you didn't think it was fair because your brothers got to ride bikes outside and you had to stay inside. I get that. A lot of siblings a lot of the time say, that's not fair if it's the same. That's like a favorite phrase in our house. It's lovely. It's lovely. All right. So I have an ex I have a, uh, I, yeah, these are band-aids, right? Okay. So I want you all to think of a time that you got an owie and you needed a band-aid. Okay. I want you to think of that, so I want to do this experiment, okay? So think of a time you needed a Band-Aid. Okay. Oliver, when was the time you needed a Band-Aid? And where did you have to put the Band-Aid? On your ankle? Okay, so if I gave you a Band-Aid, I would say, okay, put this on your ankle. Okay, now, Ben, what about you? When did you need a Band-Aid? And where did you need a Band-Aid? On your arm? Okay, but if I give you a Band-Aid, I want you to put it on your ankle, too. Okay, so if you put it on your ankle, where did you need a Band-Aid? Uh, I got a lot of yesterday, uh, and it hurt yesterday, so it does not hurt today. doesn't hurt today, but where, where is it? So where would you need to put a Band-Aid? On your knee? That's not, that's not, that doesn't hurt anymore. No, but if I gave you a Band-Aid, I'm going to tell you to put it on your ankle. And I'm going to have you, if you got an owie, put it on your ankle. And, then, and if you got an owie, no matter where it was, oh, but I, you need to put it on your ankle, though. And where did you get an owie? You don't know? Did you ever fall off your bike? Ever? Yes, you did. I know you did. Don't even think about it. And let's say you hurt your elbow when you fell off your bike, but I want you to put it on your ankle, okay? Where'd you fall? Where'd you get an owie? No, you've had band-aids before. Do you want me to ask your mom? Where, where have you had to put a band-aid before? Okay. Well, wherever your owie is, I'm going to have you put it on your ankle. Now, you guys told me different parts of your body that you got hurt, but I told you to put it all on your ankle, right? Does that seem weird? Yeah. Okay, but you guys said that every, to be fair means everybody gets the same thing, right? So that would mean putting it all on your ankle because you said ankle. That would be fair, but it's the same thing. That's what I'm saying. Like putting the Band-Aid on your ankle, on everybody's ankle, even though you're the only one who needed it on your ankle. So, so hold on one second. So 
That seems a little silly though, right? To put the band-aid on your ankle if you had an owie somewhere else. So being fair doesn't mean everybody gets the exact same thing. It means that everybody's needs are met. So if your need is you need a Band-Aid on your ankle, okay. But if your need is that you need a Band-Aid on your arm, we'd want you to put it on your arm, right? So fairness can be tricky, right? It can be tricky. But we need to be reminded that it's not meaning everybody gets the exact same thing. To look at it, though, that everybody's needs need to get met, right? You want to be able to put the Band-Aid where you need it, right? Fairness is tricky. And Jesus tries to tell a story today about what it means to be fair, right? And about God's amazing, huge generosity. And so I want you to think of this um, as you go with Karen and Brenna to learn a little bit more about fairness. And they're going to try to flush it out a little bit more with you too about what 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 fairness means in our world, okay? But you can hang on to that Band-Aid. You can put it wherever you need an owie, okay? Wherever you have an owie. And be reminded of that, okay? So let's say a prayer. Are you ready? And we'll have everybody pray with us. Dear God, Dear God thanks for loving us, for loving us and, reminding us and reminding us about your love, love. For, everyone. for everyone. We love you, we love you. A, lot. a lot. Amen. Good job, you guys. If you want to grab your garbage, your Band-Aid garbage, and just take it with you, and you can throw it away in the classroom. But if you guys want to head out with Karen and Brenda. Oh, you don't need it? Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll take it. Thanks. You guys can head out and go to some Sunday school time, okay? I'll take it. Thank you. We're now going to continue with our readings. Um, Kelly Moffitt was supposed to sing our psalm today, lead us in our psalm, but she's homesick. And so... um, Tom is going to read the psalm on behalf of Kelly today. So just so you are aware that it's a little different than what's printed in your bulletin. First reading is from the book of Jonah, chapter 3 and 4. When God saw what when God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said would bring upon them. He did not do it, but this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give him shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of the Lord. All right, now we're going to read the psalm. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you day after day and praise your name forever and ever. The Lord is kind and full of compassion, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. 
How good is the Lord to all, compassionate to all his creatures? All your works shall thank you, O Lord, and all your faithful ones bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your reign and declare your mighty deeds. The Lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his deeds. The Lord supports all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. Our second reading is from Philippians chapter 1, 21 to 30. For to me, living in Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go work in the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call all the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have been borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, am I not doing Am I doing you no wrong? Did you not agree with me for the usual, usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the, this the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated.
Well, if you were given the choice, would you choose love or justice? I know this is a hard choice, as both are really important. So if you're anything like me, you understandably would want both. And yet, every once in a while, we're forced to make a choice. And that can feel really, really hard. I think that's part of what is going on in this quite remarkable parable. You know the contours of the story as well as I do, but let's tarry for just a few moments at the climactic moments of this story. Let's first put ourselves in the place of the workers who were chosen last. Likely, they had all but given up hope for work that day and would soon make the long and disappointing trek home. They are laborers who can expect to earn from their work no more than a daily wage. Just enough, that is, to support them and their families for one more day. What we now call food insecurity is their norm. And so it's easy to imagine their excitement when they finally get an invitation to work. They won't earn a full day, day's wage, but enough probably to scrape by. And that excitement only multiplies when the manager unexpectedly and inexplicably pays them for a full day. And I suspect that equal measures of relief, joy, and gratitude suddenly course through their veins as they each receive their payment. But now if we put ourselves in the place of those who had been called to work at the beginning of the day, they too were probably grateful for employment, and they had labored all day doing the work, not because they derive any particular pleasure from their labor, but because they too have to put food on the table. And at the end of their shift, they line up, as they do every day, to receive their wage. And when word travels down the line that those hired at the end of the day receive a full daily wage, their own moment of wonder turns quickly to anticipation as they try to calculate what that might mean for them. And it's a reasonable expectation that if people who had worked only one hour received a full daily wage, that those who worked all day would maybe receive much more. But all that anticipation dissipates when the manager gives them the same payment of a daily wage. And this must seem to them so utterly unfair. They have, after all, worked literally 10 times longer than the other workers. And so resentment, rather than gratitude, now grabs a hold of them. It's all too easy, I think, for us to dismiss these laborers as ungrateful or selfish or, to borrow a biblical phrase, heart of heart. But come on, their reaction is almost exactly what most of us would have maybe felt um, if we had been in their shoes. Because what happens to them simply does not add up, and so it doesn't seem fair. Never mind it's what was contracted. If those who worked an hour received a day's wage, then those who worked so much longer deserve more. So I ask again, if forced to choose, which would you take, love or justice? Now I know this parable is at one level about generosity, but I think that every act of generosity is also and simultaneously an act of love, which brings the occasional clash of these two values. These workers, they want justice, and who can blame them? They feel cheated because they calculated their wages. And that's kind of what justice does. It counts and it measures and calculates because justice is a matter of the law and seeks to ensure that all people receive equal treatment, equal opportunity, equal standing, which is why justice is so important to us. But the manager responds that he has acted not with justice in mind, but rather with love expressed through generosity. And when these two, justice and love, clash, it can get ugly. Because where justice counts, Love loses track. And where justice calculates, love lets go. And where justice holds all things in balance, love and generosity 
give everything away, upsetting the balances we have so carefully arranged. But love, however, is not the opposite of justice. It's far from it. Rather, love passes beyond the realm of justice and law into the realm of relationship. I want you to think about that for a minute. What would it be like to govern your relationships primarily by the law of justice? Counting up every slight or injury done to you by your partner so that that they could do the same, so you could do the same for them. Or logging every hurt you experience at the hands of those around you so that you can remember, keeping a record of your grievances and waiting for amends. Keeping track of every time your child or parent disappoints you so then you can hand them the tally at the end of the day. Could you imagine living your life this way? For as we talked about this last week, while the justice makes room for relationships, it's love and generosity and forgiveness that enable those relationships to grow and to flourish. And here's the thing about this hypothetical choice between love and justice. Turns out it's not hypothetical after all. As we actually make this choice multiple times throughout our everyday. For instance, we overlook all those who drive their cars quite reasonably, but instead get driven to distraction by the one guy who cuts us off. Or when we overlook the thousand kindnesses a partner or friend has performed on our behalf, but we nurse a grudge about the one thing they did to hurt our feelings. At each of these turns, we get to choose. Will we call for justice? Or will we live out generosity and love? Put it this way, of course we want to live out of love, right? That's what we're called to do. But the truth be told, that's hard. It's really hard. As we seem almost hardwired to count our hurts and disappointments rather than our blessings. So perhaps maybe I've asked this question wrong. Acknowledging that while we want to choose love but end up calling for justice, maybe rather than asking which we would choose, I should instead point out which one God chooses. Because that's why Jesus tells this parable, right? The primary actor in this story is the vineyard owner, the one who keeps sending for workers all day long until everyone has secured employment the one who instructs the manager to pay generously, the one who takes time to answer the indignant laborer's questions, the one who in all ways and at every possible turn chooses love over justice. Now, we know God cares about justice too. That's, I'm not ruling that out. The law, the prophets, and Jesus' own life and ministry testify to that. And no matter how much we identify with those who worked all day, in the end, we realize we're the latecomers. Those who had no good reason to expect such lavish, even reckless generosity. But that's who God is. This is God that we discover, that God who looks at us in love and therefore overlooks all those places that we fall short because we do fall short and still chooses to treat us with unmerited grace and mercy and generosity every single day. So which would we choose? Well, maybe the better question is, which has God already chosen? Amen.
Together, let us confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born on the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. God, who is gracious and merciful, teach your church to invite and welcome all. Lead us to be grateful for the blessing of community. Challenge your church to choose equity and compassion over judgment. Hear us, O oh God. God, who sends the wind and the sun, you know every worm and bush by name. Help us remember that even the humblest parts of creation are precious to you. Show us how best to care for the earth and its creatures. Hear us, O oh God. Merciful God, we pray for all in any need. We pray for Caitlin and Ryan, who were married this weekend. Wrap your love and healing around all who are hurting in mind, body, and spirit, especially Wally Guptill and his family as they grieve the loss of Wally's dad, Wally Wallace Sr. We also pray for Cheryl Collard and her family as they grieve the loss of her niece, Pam. We also continue to pray for Leslie, Donnie, Jerry, Ted, Greg, Richard, Renee, Eli, Gabby, Angela, Elaine, Cindy, Susan, Sue, Dave, and all others we worry and wonder about. Hear us, O oh God. God, who is slow to anger, may we boast about the goodness of Jesus with the confidence of Paul in prison. Inspire us to find abundance in whatever vocation we are called to in the world and in service in, to our congregation. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for the health and well-being of our brothers and sisters in Tanzania. In this world that can be, feel so big, hold us all together. Hear us, O oh God. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these in the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please let us take a moment to share the peace with one another today. As you make your way back to your seats, I call upon our ushers to gather in our offerings for today.
Please stand. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us in the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, and it's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, and it's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Will you all please join me in our Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I realize we skipped holy, holy, holy. My apologies. We will do it next week, I promise. The table is ready and all are welcome. Please be seated. I invite our servers to come forward at this time as I give just a few brief instructions. The ushers are going to guide you forward to come stand around the altar where you will be given bread or a gluten-free wafer as well as wine or grape juice. If for any reason you cannot make it up here to the altar, that is not a problem. Just let the ushers know and we can come to your seat. For those of you that are worshiping with us at home, whatever elements you have, please know that they are blessed when you hear me say that the body and the blood of Christ are given and shed for you. The table is ready and all are welcome.
I invite you to stand as you are able. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace always. Amen. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So just a reminder to check all the sign-up sheets out in the narthex because there's lots going on and we don't want you to miss out. Head up to the fellowship hall to check in with one another and see how you are doing. And then for those who want to come and hear stories and see pictures from my trip, we're going to meet in here at 11 o'clock. Um, I'm going to say if you want to bring coffee in or water, that's fine. But if there's a spill, you just have to let us know so we can clean it. Fair, Sandy? Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, wonderful. May you receive this blessing as you go out into your week. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing our sending hymn 669. Go in peace. Share the harvest.